Scott Chasen debuts at KC Sports Network. This is the first episode of Booth Review. You are listening to KC Sports Network, the number one podcast network for today's Kansas City sports fans. With former players from your favorite teams, informed perspectives, and former insiders, this is the place for you. You can find us wherever you listen to podcasts or on our YouTube channel, all over social media, or our morning newsletter, KCSN Daily, dedicated to your Kansas City Chiefs. KC Sports Network is proudly presented by Emprise Bank, your partner in possible. Welcome to Booth Review, presented by Emprise Bank. Look, you can open an uh, account with Emprise Bank in less than five minutes. The savings just start there, though. Emprise is a trusted partner with a variety of products and services that can help you achieve your goals. Don't be tethered to a brick building. Start a meaningful relationship with a bank that has your best in mind. That is Emprise Bank member FDIC. And I'm starting a meaningful relationship with a guy I think has, has my best in, in mind. I am here uh, with Scott Chasen, uh, former uh, beat writer for Kansas Athletics. Uh, a uber talented guy. I'm a big fan. I was a Scott Chasen fan before I was a Scott Chasen friend. Scott, my man, I am so beyond excited to be uh, covering KU football with you this year. Welcome. Uh, really hyped to have you here at KCSN. How you doing, buddy? I'm doing great. And yep, I'm hosting this with Ken, so we can get going. No, I'm just <laughs> kidding. No, look. Um, yeah, I've. I've Obviously been around KU athletics for a while and I'm, I'm really excited because we've talked about KU even before, you know, we did this. And speaking of, that was the most professional intro of any segment <laughs> or anything I've ever done. It was just the excitement off the top. Good God. I was wondering who this person was uh, in this, in this uh, virtual room across from me with that ad read. That was great. Had a segue. It was professional and everything. And by the way, Ken, I don't know if you know this, but both of us have, you know, we have reached the pinnacle of football playing, you know, a pretty important position at the highest level. Do people know your playing experience? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I've talked about it a little bit. I played in college uh, at Mid American Nazarene. Wound up, uh, funnily enough, uh, a couple of my teammates there, Jamal Green, who was a part of the Orange Bowl team, uh, Sean Ransberg, who was a KU uh, commit before some things happened. He wound up there. So, like, I mean, I've even got some ties to some guys, you know, that that played at KU too. But yeah, former quarterback. And, uh, I mean, wasn't particularly good, but you know, no, we don't need to talk about that. <laughs> so, so look, you were a former quarterback and, and Tucker, I believe we have a photo of this. I was a former quarterback too. Um, what? yeah, that's a, <laughs> that is a real picture that Kent has not seen before. Now the form is really good. It's the left hand that and the left arm. I don't know what I'm doing there. That really does it for me. Uh, that was a David Beatty practice where one day they decided to let the media partake in a throwing competition. So uh, both Ken and I have reached the pinnacle, <laughs> the pinnacle of uh, athletic achievement at the college level. So you're getting this from two quarterbacks here. I think that's what we're really excited about. Who won, though? Like, who won the quarterback throwing competition? That's what I want to know. Oh, man. Let's see. I remember. Um I tied for second and tied for second isn't good because it was like five throws and I think I hit two of them. So, but they were the last two. It, it took me a little bit to get my bearings. Mm -hmm. uh, Tom Keegan, who used to be at the LJ world was in the competition. He was warming up like on the sideline. And at one point I went over to him and I was like, I was like, Tom, what are you doing? And he's like, Oh, we're throwing today. And I was like, okay, I guess we'll figure out how that goes. Uh, Nick Krug of the Lawrence and world photographer. He was actually the winner of the competition. And so everyone, the players had to pick who they thought were going to win. So all those people thought I was going to win um, as like the young guy there. And they all had to do push-ups, and I felt very bad, man. You let everybody down Scott. Yeah. I didn't do push-ups with them either. Um, and it wasn't that many. I just was like, not going to do that. It was spring football and it was hot. So yeah, I really let them down and then I kind of turned my back on them and um, then David Beatty got fired. So I think all those things were related. Scott, there is so many uh, KU quarterback jokes to be made about <laughs> about that situation right there. Like, I mean, I don't. I mean, hey, you know, they Carter Stanley had a good career. He had a fantastic career, but you know, they you might have been in the mix before Carter. <laughs> like, <laughs> there's what an outside chance. 
It depends because, hey, right, each coach had their guy. I think if I were on the roster when David Beatty was still the coach, I would have been in the mix before Carter. <laughs> Maybe different later on. But, yes, I, I, hey, I could hold my own. I was uh, Heritage Academy in Tulsa, Oklahoma, elementary school graduating class of four. Uh, I was the star quarterback for that team. So, there you go. Um, I, shout out to that. I, I never quite made it to the to the real level. I'm also like five six for people who don't know that. So yeah, football quarterback wasn't going to be my thing. I mean, you and Kyler Murray. Uh, I, I saw. I think I saw Khalil Herbert in there in that picture too. I think. I think I saw Khalil Herbert watching you. I could, I was trying to see if I could pick anybody else out, but I, I'm pretty sure I saw Khalil Herbert there right behind you in the number ten in the red helmet. But. I uh, couldn't remember all the people I, at the time. I remember looking up like who, who was there? Who's in this picture? There's another photo that shows the form even worse, but yeah, no, it was, it was the legit practice. It was the whole team and everything. Yeah. That left hand was it's kind of a no man's land a little bit there, buddy. We got, <laughs> yeah. you got to really, you need, yeah, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta get the hips through there a little bit mm -hmm. more too, I think, but like we can, we can work on that later. Yeah. Uh, luckily I think the coaching staff we have now, if they got their hands on you, they would maximize your full potential. Uh, uh they would kick me off the team, but yes. <laughs> hey, no, you're, <laughs> they would be, we're going to maximize his full potential by getting him off of this field immediately. If you, I, where would you rank on that? You know, that one to one ten chart that they have apparently where they're just ranking everybody on every single metric whatsoever. Whether yeah, I, did you read that article in ESPN? It was like, They've got like, they, they just aired out everybody's lunch. They got one through 110 ranked out there. I love it. Yeah, no, it, what's funny is so, so many guys, so many different programs too have had different ways of evaluating quarterbacks. And I remember Brent Deerman had a scale that was like, it was like one to seven in like six different categories or something. And he was a math guy. And I always was so interested of like these non-normalized scale where you'd be like, oh yeah, that guy's a 39. And that's like, you'd be like, okay. Um, but no, uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't rank highly, but fortunately for Kansas, at least I think their, uh, their quarterback position is a little more set um, than even it was then. Oh, I will probably get there today and uh, about every episode. There's a lot of reason to be excited there at the quarterback position and just period this coaching staff. Speaking of then we're talking about everybody's in town. Uh, first week or first day of camp was uh, today as we're recording this Tuesday, August 2nd. Um, you got to hear from uh, Lance Leipold uh, in his second year at, at Kansas, the head coach of the Jayhawks. And uh I mean, you know, obviously there's not a ton to overreact to with, you know, there's not a ton of clips. There's not as many clips of, of KU football right now as there are of like the Chiefs going on right now. Obviously, those practices are contained. That's the same across the board for everybody in college football. You're not there's not open practices. Get to see a few. We saw Tanaka Scott making a phenomenal catch. But I think the takeaways and some of the stuff you kind of you know you lean on a little bit is you know, Lance Leipold had his press conference today. Also, they had, you know, a 12-minute video at practice today as well as, you know, uh, Matt Gildersleeve, I believe, talked as well. Uh, any just takeaways off the top from, from Lance Leipold's uh, press conference today? Well, look, uh, having been in beat media for a long time, the first day of practice was always like, you get all these reporters coming in, used to be myself, asking questions, and then have coaches be like, guys, it's the first day of practice. We don't know anything. Um <laughs> I think the biggest thing to go back to the quarterback thing was Lance Leipold. I, I mean, at big 12 media day, he kind of dropped the charade of a quarterback competition. You know, they brought Jalen Daniels first of all. So that was a, a pretty good sign. He was going to be the starter. I think the only other time it's been a more fictitious quarterback battle was Oklahoma with Spencer Rattler when Lincoln Riley was like, no, it's a, you know, he kept saying it was competition and then finally just kind of had to name him. But uh, look, so I think we knew it was going to be Jalen Daniels then. But for him to actually say it on the first practice, and he even kind of quipped that, like, you can write, Leipold says he expects Jalen Daniels to start. Um, that's not something Kansas has had, even when Kansas has thought it has had the guy. And actually, I'd argue more often than not, when Kansas thinks it has a quarterback in the first practice, that guy ends up losing the quarterback competition. Um, that was certainly the case when Carter Stanley beat out Thomas McVitie, the guy they, you know, brought in to win the job. Um it was kind of almost the case last year with Jason Bean, who probably doesn't win the quarterback battle if uh, his competition doesn't get injured, giving him the chance to even get back into it after he was probably third on the depth chart. So, uh, you know, it's it's a little bit of a different feel with the quarterback spot. And I think that was my big takeaway that Lance Leipold has a quarterback he actually likes. And at Kansas, that's not common. Well, like, you know, you look at it and like – 
obviously, I think everyone and their mom knew Jalen Daniels is going to start week one. Like, and all their ad, everything that they've done to this point with some of the media that they've put out there with, you know, with, with regards to stuff on KUAthletics.com or, I mean, even just him showing up to media day. There's not, I don't think you have a ton of heated battles. Uh, you know, one person in a heated battle going to media day to represent your football team. Mm-hmm. That's a, it's a very, you know, there's a very narrow group of guys that you have representing your football team. And I, I mean, what Jalen Daniels, everything Jalen Daniels has done since the Texas game has, you know, has been the right thing. You know, the, the reasoning behind, hey, I'm willing to burn my red shirt. I'm here to help, you know, build on the foundation of what just happened in the Texas game. I want to, you know, be here to help turn this thing around. And, you know, he thought those last few games was a, was means for him to help turn this thing around, right? Everything since that Texas game you've known, like, has, has been building up to this. It's refreshing to kind of hear, even though this 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 culture that Lance Leipold is building is so contingent on this depth and competition, you know, and you see it throughout the roster. We'll, we'll probably get there at some point today, but the fact that he's kind of willing to, you know, <laughs> bypass that a little bit. Uh, I, I guess, like, one of the things I'm curious, though, is, like, you know, if they'd asked, if they'd asked, uh, if they'd asked, uh, him about Mike Nowitzki. Mm-hmm. I bet you the exact same answer is th- it's like the exact same answer. Like I expect Mike Nowitzki to start. Like that's as about as close as you're gonna get. Like it's it's happening. It's gonna happen, and it's the right move for Kansas. And I'm geeked out about watching the future of this kid. Yeah, I, and I think just the way he ended last year. You know, I was on ain't no seats, and um, I made a comment. And there's a video on Twitter. You can see it where. I, Look, I, I think we'll talk about expectations in the season. Kansas, to me, profiles like a 2-3 win team. But the thing where it turns, and I said this then, I'll say it now, is if Jalen Daniels is the Jalen Daniels from the last three games of last year consistently, plus some development, like that's a top 3-4 Big 12 quarterback. And so then Kansas is going to win more games than that. They could win double that. Um, they could win four, five, six games. I don't think that's crazy. What I think is the question, though, is – can Jalen Daniels get there and will the pieces around him allow him to elevate his game to get there? And I think that's what you start to see at camp. You know, uh, Lance Leipold talked about the offensive line today. I thought that was interesting where, you know, he kind of remarked, you're always looking for, you know, those six, seventh and eighth guys. Maybe they feel like they have five. Now it's, is their depth? And I think that's the same pretty much across the board because um, whether it's the strongest positions on the team, like running back, you're still kind of trying to figure out who's filling into what spot. Or if it's weaker spots, like I'd argue cornerback, I think wide receiver is one of those. You're just trying to figure out something. And so I, I think there are the battles within the battles, but there are more spots than you would normally think that are pretty solidified. Jalen Daniels being one, I think a bunch of them on the starting offensive line um, have been said. And yeah, it's weird. It's different. It, it's also very strange to be jumping into this knowing they, they've got a month, like they've got a month and then they got to go. They got to play some real teams and the schedule is not easy for them either. It's not easy, but like I look at what this team was able to pull together in such a short amount of time last year, like getting that team to play con- competitive after they'd been getting the break speed off them for the entirety of the season towards the end. Like I'm not worried about the 30 days. I think I think I think KU will come in more prepared than than we've probably seen them at any point in the last decade. Uh, because I think this team has figured out they've set the standard, they've set the culture. They've they've set expectations, and this team's not gonna let. I mean, the, I, it's the most cliche football thing ever, but the standard is the standard. <laughs> like they're actually living it out in Lawrence right now, <laughs> and and I, I I'm not worried about the window. I I feel pretty good about what this team is. You know what this team is. You know gonna look like week one. It's just a matter of. I I I, I, I want to ask this. I, what is holding them back outside of the quarterback mm-hmm. position? What's holding them back from being more than a three win team? Like, what do you see that says like for you, I, this, this profiles as a three win team. Is it just the lack of depth? I think depth is a big part of it. And I think depth's a big part of it because like, go back to last year, I think it was the Baylor game. It was like 14 to seven at halftime. And you're like, they're kind of in this, but they can't score, and eventually guys are going to wear down because they don't have enough of them. And then all of a sudden you look up the final score at the end of the game, and it's like 41 to 14 or something like that. 
and, and how many times that happened. I mean, games against Duke, Coastal Carolina, that they're in it into the second half, in some cases into the fourth quarter. And then you look at the final margin and it's like, that ended up being a 21 or a 28 point game. So I think depth is one. I think quarterback plays one this year. I think receiver, although I think generally they've had pretty good receivers. Um, and then I, I just think defensively, they've always had really, they've had a good group of like individuals and cornerstones and guys, but they've almost had like, it's been so up and down at certain positions that they've had guys basically abandon all principles because they're worried about covering for everyone else. And then it just drags the whole defense down and I think that's been a problem even when there have been like really talented individual guys and they haven't been able to keep a lot of them, right? Like losing Karan Prunty to South Carolina at the time. I know he's transferred again since. Losing Marcus Harris to Auburn. Losing Dejon Terry to Tennessee. Losing Elijah Jones to Oregon State. Like they've, they've had guys and then just kind of lost them. So I think it's a combination of all of that. But I don't know. I mean, they have a top 25 transfer class this year. What, what do you see as realistic? Um like, like best case scenario, what's the, what's, what's realistic for this team? I mean, a best case scenario is this team is going bowling. Like I, I genuinely think like that's the best case scenario for this team. I think it's in the range of outcomes. I think six wins is, is feasible. Uh, and that's cause I believe in the quarterback and mm-hmm. I, I don't know where we're going to talk. Like, I think there's, he's probably going to pop up a few times, but I, as a guy that I, 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 I'm a guy that evaluates quarterback play a lot. I do it a lot on the Chiefs side here at KCSN. I do a lot of Mahomes coverage. Um, that's where my background is. I learned from an NFL. Uh, I learned an NFL offense from an NFL quarterback who kind of helped me develop and learn a lot of different things. That's kind of where my background is. Some of the things that Jalen Daniels did late last year were just so wildly impressive. I mean, I think about there's this throw. Kwame Lasseter doesn't drop very many passes, but there's this route. There's this corner route that, or, or a deep over route that uh, Jalen Daniels, he drops back. He has to kind of step up into the pocket. He has to run back into the pocket, and he looks back across the field and throws this, drops this ball to Kwame Lasseter against Texas. And It's just this very cerebral play, understanding where the route distribution was heading even after the play's breaking down, having the athleticism and the fluidity to kind of throw across his body a little bit, throw an up and down ball over defenders, perfectly placed. That was probably probably Jalen Daniels' best throw of the Texas game, and it got dropped, which doesn't happen very often by Kwame Laster. Uh, But just this beautiful beautiful play, and you saw – the up and down ball against Texas uh, in the red zone on the on the scene uh, to which tight end was it? Was it uh, was it Could Mason Fairchild? It's Mason Fairchild. Mason Fairchild. No, 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 no. Trevor Mason Cardell, Fairchild. Too many of them. It was Mason Char- Fairchild yeah. before he got hurt uh, in that game. I just there's so many like layered throws that he's already showing the ability, the ability to move on the run. You saw some of his. He's he's not a slouch with the ball in his hands running the football. There's so many little you know things there. I don't think it's in the out, you know, I don't think it's in outside the realm of possibility that that kind of talent elevates the rest of this football team. But I don't think that's just the only indicator that gets me excited about the ceiling of this team, the ability to make a bowl game, the depth. I think they've added in some key positions, like not necessarily across the board. They're paper thin in some areas. I think you got a lot of questions on the offensive line, which is a terrible place to be. Mm -hmm. But I mean, they've gotten, they've gotten older. They've gotten a year older with their young guys. They've gotten older with the competition that they've brought in. You talk about with the transfer group, like there there's reason I, you know, I I think every, I think every Jayhawk fan that pays attention to the football feels it, but refuses to admit it. (laughs) Sure. Sure. Well, let let me ask you this. I want to, I want to stick you. You've got me kind of intrigued with an idea that I want to ask you about kind of like ask the quarterback here. So I'm going to go back to Carter Stanley again. I've gone back to him a couple times. Um, in his last year, he had Dalen Charlotte. Like, he had great receiving talent. He had Stephon Robinson. He had Andrew Parchment. He had guys. But he had Dalen Charlotte that on third downs, contested balls, when you need a touchdown down the stretch, he went to time and time again. I remember uh, doing a story at the time, just like the number of essentially high leverage situations, use a baseball term, mega football, um, that he immediately he's going straight to Dale and Charlotte, especially a third down. I think it was against Texas um, contested ball 50, 50 Dale and Charlotte, huge hands just rips it away. 
what does it do to a quarterback and what does it do to an offense if you don't have that guy and you don't even have like the B version of that right now? I mean, maybe the number one receiver on the team was in the transfer portal for like a week in the middle of the off season and LJ Arnold, like, what does it mean when you don't have that? Yeah, that's going to be, that's going to be one of the big things, you know, is, is who steps up and, and how does that feel for him? It, it's not a great feeling. You know, it's it's not a great feeling, you know, to not have a, a safety net like that. But I think it necessitates you finding one. And it's just a question of, you know, do you have some guys that you 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 feel like you can trust in some of those situations? And, you know, the chemistry that's been built from the last time we saw this this group, who I think every single one of the, them's 10 pounds uh, heavier, and with combustion, you know, which is great. Something, they're, yeah. they're, you know. But I, I think, you know, I think it's just going to necessitate him building chemistry with the guys that are still there with him, right? And, mm -hmm. you know, th I don't think the cupboard's entirely bare. Um, maybe that just means they have to go for it on fourth down if they come up short, too. But um, I think I think that's going to be, you know, it, it, that's going to be a big question mark for sure, is who's the guy that becomes the the, the safety blanket, the, the guy that you really turn to for targets, I would keep an eye on, you know, like Luke Grimm's a guy I'm yes. kind of keeping an eye on. Oh, was, you, was that where you were going? <laughs> I was wondering if you were going to go there. Um, I wasn't like, I wasn't setting you up to go Luke Grimm. I was just, as you were talking, I was like, yeah, I'm thinking kind of Luke Grimm here. I think like, I think Grimm has a chance to be that kind of guy, you know, but I think the way this offense wants to operate is they want to spread the ball around a little bit more too. And they want to be multiple. And part of being multiple is you're probably going to see the ball distributed in a lot of different ways, too. So, like, I think circumstantially, maybe it's just Jared Casey. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but, you know, like, I think there's some circumstantial stuff there, too, about how the ball gets distributed. I think that's the way Andy Colton Nicky wants it anyway. Um, this group's, I mean, this team's going to be pretty multiple, I think. And, like, yeah. I think that's one of their, you know, they'll, they'll do what works. But they've got, you know, definite strengths to play, mm -hmm. too when it comes to the personnel for this team on the offensive side of the ball. And I think there's a lot of different ways the ball can get distributed. I will say, yeah, it, it, it sucks for him to not necessarily have the Kwame last. Like, I think that's one of the big question marks. I look at this roster and I go, mm -hmm. I mean, the, I think there's some interesting guys. I I'm, I'm a little bit higher on the receiver group, I think than maybe mm -hmm. some are, but having that guy, I don't think, you know, yet. Well, I was going to say, just jump on what you said about Andy Kotelnicki. I don't know if you're familiar with this quote. It's a little bit old, so you might not know it. But I'll, I'll ask you, he's he's referred to the KU offense as a blank-headed dragon. How many heads do you think that is? Oh, my. Uh, I have no clue. You got to give a number. I mean, it's just a number. 17. Okay, it's six. So you overshot okay. it, but six. He wants to do a bunch of different things, and that's – I. I don't have the list in front of me, but uh, it's personnel groups, it's style of play, it's what they're doing both in the run and pass game. And so I think when you talk about variety, and I think one of the conversations we want to have at some point is personnel groupings and just like where Kansas sees its strengths, where how it wants to utilize and, and to get its best players on the field. I think that is the one thing Kansas does have going for it going into the season because like it's a really micro conversation, especially in like a first episode to talk about like, well, who is the security blanket receiver? But I, I think right now, like if you're Kansas and you have a quarterback, the clock starts immediately. Like you're Kansas, you found a guy. Now you need to support him with as many pieces and as many positions as possible. And I think one of the things that, you know, Tanaka Scott's kind of an example. He's a guy who's got good straight line speed. He's got explosive, explosive ability. He can jump. He's tall. Can he do the rest of it? And, and I think a lot of the guys fall into that category too. So that's why I kind of asked the question just because, I'm curious what is almost realistic for this KU offense as a whole. You have great running backs. You've got a quarterback you feel good about. You've got a center, probably three to four offensive linemen you feel decent about. Maybe not great, but at least decent, um, which is something for KU. What does that look like? How many points does that translate to? How explosive can they be? And can they score enough to beat some big 12 teams this year? I And the one thing I keep coming back to when it comes to the KU offense is oh, I like okay so the offensive line like it's a great it's a great talking point I don't know if they have the best offensive line I don't you know it sounds it, it by all indications Lance Leipold feels pretty good about his offensive line which is always a positive um I don't think that they're the most talented group that we've seen uh or well maybe well maybe it's maybe in a while for a few years yeah <laughs> but the one thing I keep coming back to is part of the reason that 
the offensive line, and part of the reason the offense looked a lot better late is because the offensive line and that team finally figured how to block zone up. I remember watching the first game against South Dakota last year, and it was a train wreck up front. Mm-hmm. Um, the the blocking was they, those guys. They just it it looked awful. And the, the, one of the things that gets you so excited, gets me so excited about watching this football team prep progress and grow was that drastic change mm-hmm. from getting blown off the ball against South Dakota, not being able to redirect, get your hips around, uh, and kind of you know really you know run that outside zone scheme that this team really wants to run, and seeing them completely change from mm-hmm. that week to what you saw late in the season and the backs Felton Gardner had no clue what he was watching, looking yeah. at <laughs> in, in that, in that blocking scheme early in the year. But then you saw, you know, the backs that stuck with it for the entirety of the season really start to figure things out. That gives me optimism about this offense and the growth. And like, I think you know, the, fa- the fundamentals and the foundation of what this offense is built upon got so much better over the course of the year that what you stack around it, personnel groups and groupings, mi- mixing and matching, getting the foundational mm-hmm. stuff set there, I think is going to create a lot of problems for teams, you know, in, in, in mixing and matching. And I, I, we had a rundown and we're like 30 minutes in. We're probably, yeah, we're I don't not, know how far we're going to get there. And we're like, not, we're we not, we can take bits it. and pieces of it, but like, yeah. I think the thing I like, I think, I think, the, I think KU can go big. I think they mm-hmm. can go play big with big tight ends, and especially in the Big Twelve, it's kind of like a, it's a mix, you know, a mix and yeah. match. You go get big if you don't feel like that team's, you know, that so a lot of these teams want to base in lighter personnel in the Big Twelve. Go get big, you know, go throw, mm-hmm. go throw three tight ends out there, throw Jared Casey out there, uh, and you know, Will Huggins and uh, uh, Tavita Noah, you know, go get big. You can move Jared Casey around, put him in the backfield. There's a lot of things you can do with him there. There's some flexibility to that group. You can get really big and throw Lawrence Arnold out there at the the lone receiver. Like you can do some stuff there, I, but you can also I think you can I still think you can get into some of these lighter personnel with like the three receiver stuff too because Luke Grimm like giving some playing some space there too, and then the backs like there's like there's so many yeah. mix, there's mix, there's personnel all over the place like there's so many varieties you can throw at this team and I think that's exactly yeah. what we talked about like. Andy Cole Nicky has different places to or different guys to kind of move around. Yeah. Well, I, the running backs you mentioned too. I mean, they have so many good running backs that they might put one in the slot who was a former four star running back. I mean, in Savion Morrison. Um, I, I just think it's really interesting to me. I, I, kind of a big question and a thought on this coaching staff. Like the thing I think they do the best, and this isn't just, you know, covering the team. This is going, you know, I used to cover recruiting. This is going to recruiting camps and watching how they work with people versus the David Beatty staff versus the Les Miles staff, both of which I covered too. Um, This staff is so instruction based and like you look around the assistants they have, they think about things so differently. And with, you know, every coach has a football first perspective, but they notice like such little and weird and specific quirky things, especially like you just like go to a camp and watch them work with a guy who, you know, has no shot of making it to Kansas. He's just there to maybe get some exposure, maybe some other coaches see him or something. And, and yet they're, you know, they notice something with how he plants his foot or what, you know, whatever they're doing, hand placement, something with blocking. And they just want to teach. I think that shows in the offensive line. I think Scott Fuchs is, I think he's a tremendous kind of careful there. This is a family friendly channel. (laughs) Hey, we talked about that, you know, when you say his name, you have to think of the word books, and that is the only safe way to rhyme it because, yeah, that's a dangerous name. It's not Fuchs. It is actually Fuchs, which is uh, – that is a very dangerous name. But, no, he's great. I, his his kind of instruction and, and how he coaches guys up, I think he's the best offensive line coach Kansas has had. As far back as I would possibly know, it would have to be someone um, – you know, that, that I don't know who the answer to that is. Um, I, I think Andy Kotelnicki, I think Zabrowski with the quarterbacks, like I think they think about football in such specific and different ways. And by the way, how cool is it to have an offensive coordinator who likes being the tight ends coach because the tight end is so involved in run and the tight end is so involved in the pass game. Like that's not a normal way that offensive coordinators or offensive personnel guys kind of think. And so I just think you have like, I'm going to use a basketball term that's kind of becoming popular. You have like a bunch of football sickos who just like 
They're mm-hmm. obsessed with football and they're all working together and they're all staying on staff. So I, I think that's the thing they do best. I'm not sure if you have an, another thought on that of what well, like this coaching staff does. It's best. just great. It's just like you talk about Kotal Nikki and it's like that tight, that, that laser focus on the tight ends, like the bridge between contrasting styles that you see in college football. And obviously a lot more of the spread stuff is really being more adopted in a lot of the, you know, more empty and all that stuff, but like you still got teams that are willing to kind of go big and line it up and play with bigger personnel and run the football and stuff. That tight end is the middleman. It's the bridge. It's kind of telling you, you know, it's it's the it's the tipping point in a lot of different ways. And like I think that kind of speaks to how he's so willing to kind of, you know, handle it it the best way that that team's gonna you know, that his team's gonna win that week. That's a perfect like I think that is a perfect representation of why his offense is the way it is because i think he, that 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 position kind of turns into the bridge for this you know for how you know how this team can play but like i think they can play both sides of that bridge i really do like again like i i'm more bullish on the receivers like the tight ends like they've this team's they're, they're so big they're bigger they're just mm-hmm. a there's a bigger football team that can play big at times i mean even even Jalen daniels is bigger now <laughs> yeah no they, they've got legit size and i think the other thing is they know what they want to do, um, especially like tempo being another factor of this, knowing that like, hey, they they don't have to run around. And, and if they don't want to, if they don't think it's the right matchup, use a bunch of light personnel and um, try and play an up and down game. I mean, think about the Oklahoma game. They went so slow in that game. They literally broke the clock in the stadium. Like, I don't know if you remember this. The clock went out in the yeah. first half, right? <laughs> and so they've got some guy counting it off and they're still trying to milk like every second of it. Um, and and they're just playing different ways than I think a lot of people like then I, football still operates in multiple ways, especially like Kansas state's been a running team. There are other teams that do it, but their ability to kind of camouflage and change styles. I think that's so interesting to me. And uh, it, it makes for very interesting football, very interesting roster. I actually have something. I think this is a good idea. A last like kind of topic for us to, to sort of end this first episode on. Um, that gets us a little bit back closer to the rundown. Okay. <laughs> we've got, hey, we got like 10 subjects that we can hit during the off season here. Now it's great. We're covered. We should, uh, we need, we needed to go back and start this podcast in July. Maybe we would get through with this. Um, okay. One position group you feel the best about after running backs. Cause I, th- I think running back is where we'd be. And then the one you're the most shaky on. And then I'll mm. go to. All right. So I keep looking at the linebacker group going they've gotten older they've gotten more athletic and they've got a true too deep like i'm looking at the competition in that group just going man they have added so many as like Corn- cornell wheeler is a former four-star recruit out of like played it or was at michigan for a year and he's like an afterthought he's not even really in the conversation for us sitting here right now because this team has added so many linebacks Ty- taiwan barry i thought showed some promise last year they add Tristan Fletcher, Eric Gilliard, Craig Young, uh, Rich Miller. Uh, McCaskill's supposed to be coming in, you know, this week. But Gavin Potter's probably not. Like, I, I'm going to be a little bit surprised if Gavin Potter's a starter this year. And so, like, I just look at the depth that this group has created up front or, or at the linebacker position. I'm blown away. Like, I'm, I'm scratching my head trying to figure out how he's going to keep, how they're going to keep all these guys happy. They've got a true two deep now. Like a real legitimate two deep where you can, you know, you can reduce the snap count a little bit. You can withstand some injuries and they've got, you talk about personnel grouping and mixing, mixing and matching. Like Craig Young is a guy, the, the, the linebacker who's formerly a safety at Ohio state. Like the, the, KU could get like real big and, and mess around and play him in the slot potentially. In K, like they could almost go with like a four, four at times because he's that kind of athlete. They could play him in like a, in a slot position at times. So like that group's deep and interesting and diverse. And I really like how that group shaked out. Well, you talk about improvement. I think there's no way a group, it would be problematic if there is a group that improves more than them is, is I guess the way I'm trying to put it, like that group should have the most improvement because linebacker has been a problem for yeah. Kansas yeah. for a while. And you're right. I mean, they addressed it through transfer. They addressed it through retaining a few guys. I think Rich Miller, um, if Rich Miller is kind of in the Kwame Lassiter category to me, that if he's your best linebacker, you, you don't feel great about your linebacker group. But if he's one of your guys, like, especially if he's like a third-ish guy, fourth, you know, maybe a little bit yeah. more down. That's about right. Feel, 
like you want him in the rotation. You want him playing. You just don't necessarily, you know, he's maybe not the star, at least what he's shown so far. So I think that definitely tracks. I won't even say like, I think the safeties group is going to be really good. I, I think the interior offensive line to kind of cheat a little bit. I, I think they've got three guys there uh, between Michael Ford, Mike Nowitzki, who they call Dirk. I think that's funny. I mean, it's just, it's not spelled the same, but whatever. And then Armaje Reed Adams, who was 391 and then he was down to like 350 something and then he lost another 15 pounds so like well everyone is getting bigger i think like i think of- uh gildersleeve said he's in the 320s uh yeah. today on the 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 ku uh, live from training camp today well so. so like you talked about well everyone's getting bigger he's like getting in shape and learning how to like he's cut um and and by all accounts by everyone who's been out in ca- at camp and all the media I, they're like blown away with how he looks i think those are three guys who can move some people I think those are three guys who know how to block. Um, and I think I think those are guys that, especially with Armaje Reed Adams having kind of the year to sit back and learn. I mean, he's had early playing experience. He came in under Les Miles. I mean, most of that line was built under Les Miles. Um, actually, Bostic, I think, goes back to David Beatty. Um, yeah, but- he was. I remember I remember when Bostic was was recruited and like he was like kind of a late add to their class and like they didn't, they didn't know quite what they were gonna do with him, but like he was like a two star guy. They were really excited about going back to Armage, uh, Reed, Reed Adams. It's it's Reed Adams, right? It, it was yeah, Adam Reed. Now yeah. it's Reed. Now it's Reed Adams. So Malik Clark was a horrific fit. I Marik, Marik, he great, great, uh, you know, great Jayak had a you know great career, good player, but he was not a good fit at all for what the what KU was trying to run. He played out of necessity. He played out of a respect for, you know, I, I think there was some level of respect. He was not a good fit for that blocking scheme. Um, so the, 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 some of the lighter slider moving guys, I think I'm curious to watch him, our Marge, our Marge Reed Adams move movement skills. It's going to be hard not to be better than what Malik Clark was able to do in that particular blocking scheme. And that's, again, I don't want to knock on Malik Clark. It's just, it's just, it wasn't a good fit for what he does. And that just having five guys on the field with that can do what you're being asked to do is so massive for this, you know, for, for an offensive line too. that could be a addition by subtraction is not fair to Malik Clark, Mm -hmm. but I think schematically what they wanted to do better fit other guys than him. And so like, there's reason to be excited just there too. Like, I think, you know, just, you know, I think he's a he's a better fit. I think it's funny you you talk about safety. I talk about linebackers, two of the worst positions for the for the for KU last year. And we're sitting here talking about okay, there's some depth. This is these are two of the better position mm-hmm. groups on this team now. Like, I mean, that's like, okay. Like that that who knows what kind of impact that makes on the 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 outlook of this football team that they've turned two of their biggest weaknesses into arguably strengths. Yeah, at least relative strengths and relative to what they've had. So now, is there one you're concerned about? Okay, cornerback. Well, I'm sure there are. I was going to say, yeah. I'm sure there are a few. Yeah, cornerback's the one. You know, there's some there's some unproven guys. There's they're still really young at the cornerback position. Um, I know Kalen Gervin's there. Like that's going to help. Monte McGarry provides some, you know, some veteran, you know, presence there, but you still got, you know, you, you've got a lot of young guys. It does look, I mean, Jacoby Bryant doesn't look like they've been able to put any weight on him still. Mm-hmm. And like, he's shown a lot of promise, but you know, playing at 170 is playing at 170. Um, I, I think that's going to be a position that I look at and uh, there's just a lot of question marks and there's a lot of youth there still. And, and hopefully one or two of those guys can really kind of rise above and, and, you know, help, but like, that's the position, like that's the one position I'm like, if you're just looking on paper at their, you know, their starting 22 cornerback still where I'm the most worried. Cornerback is definitely a concern. And I think you look at guys who have played like Romello Dotson has played a lot. He's struggled in coverage. He's struggled with tackling like, and that's not a knock on him. He's a young guy playing who maybe wouldn't be in that position if the team had other pieces. I think it's probably, there in linebacker that it is most important that the transfers they brought in hit because if they didn't then you basically got the same problems now i'm it's interesting i think you're higher on the wide receivers than i am i am very high on jacoby bryant personally even um I, i'm just impressed by his sheer ball skills like his ability to make a play it's not even ball skills that's that's not even the right word i guess um because like i think oj burrows for example might have the best ball skills on the team 
But Jacoby Bryant just has that kind of knack, almost like a Tyron Mas- uh, Matthew S knack, where it's just like in a in a moment, a singular moment when a huge play, there's an opportunity to go and make one. He doesn't miss that opportunity. It doesn't mean he always makes it. It doesn't mean he makes the play in the biggest moment of the game. But if there is that moment presented and he is the guy in coverage, it feels like he's going to make it. I think he had a pick six last year. I can remember going to practices. Can- where he- Kansas, he had a pick six, didn't he? Yeah. Or against Texas. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, did I say and, Kansas? I said Kansas. Yeah, yeah. Against Texas? I, I know what you meant. I know what you meant. Um, but no, I, I went to a, a practice where he had a pick. I went to another practice. He might have had a pick six in the spring game, um, as I remember. And this was a guy who almost left in their signing class. So anyway, I I will spare you the uh, Jacoby Bryant diatribe, but I like Jacoby Bryant. That being said, I'm nervous about the cornerbacks too. Um, opposite them, a less important position, you, you could argue, but – I'm very nervous about the receivers and I don't think they're necessarily bad. Like I think LJ Arnold has a lot of potential. I've been on kind of the Tanaka Scott camp um, since he committed. And I can remember talking to some KU assistants about him who kind of thought like, yeah, he could kind of get on the field as like a straight line sort of vertical deep threat guy. Um, It's funny. Use another cross sport comparison. He's like a straight line driver and they're just trying to get him to do something else, but um, (laughs) like in basketball, but no, I, I think he's got, He's got some potential. They obviously went to the transfer portal with uh, Douglas Emelian. Like they've got some guys and and Luke Grimm is probably the most, you know, originally they recruited Luke Grimm as a safety and he was just so good at receiver that eventually they, their hand was kind of forced and they had to let him and then had to let him play because they weren't even playing him into his first season. And he emerged as, you know, one of the best receivers on the team. So um, they've got kind of like this ragtag group of individuals that they're going to try and piece together and I, I don't think it's impossible for someone to break out, but I'm pretty nervous about that position because I, I just don't see it in the same way that they've had it before. And I know they were hesitant to take a bunch of names because they felt like they were over scholarship there. And that's kind of another problem too when you get into roster building. Yeah, I, I just, I don't think there's going to be a guy, but I think there's enough guys that I think can do enough. And like I think you, even like looking at, I, I, you know, Luke Grimm came on a little bit later and made some big plays late in the season. That little stretch there, he looked a lot better, a lot more comfortable. Um, and made some really, I think he made a tough catch over the middle, keeping him. I think it might have been the West Virginia game that he was keeping him in there a little bit with one of those big plays. And I mean, there's just some, there, there's, there, it doesn't feel like a, well, all right, another analogy building, building the, you know, built you type, they talk about building your, your personal groupings and your receiver room like a basketball team doesn't feel like they really have a, a, a really well-built basketball team. Like there's just, you know, there's some, there's some holes there in how the, the construction of that position group is. I think they can fill in the gaps though, by figuring things out a little bit with the comes to the running backs, a little bit with the tight ends they are better blocking blocking needed to get a lot better. And I got better over the course of the season. Mm-hmm. It was so, blocking from the tight end position was really, really bad beginning of yeah. the year, like awful. Uh, just blocking in general was really rough for them beginning the year. They got better as the season went on. Really, real quick, going back to the cornerback mm-hmm. thing. One thing I do worry about, and one of the things I think when it comes to the Jacoby Bryant's of the world, um, because I, I I really like Jacoby Bryant too. But one of the things I think teams really like to do is attack the edges with quick throws. Just you know, like bigger receivers trying to block out there on the edge. And, you know, those cornerbacks have to be physical at the mm-hmm. line of scrimmage and being willing to take on that block and kind of get, get everything pushed inside of them so that hopefully the linebackers are there to, you know, to chase. Yeah. And I think that's one thing I, I kind of worry about a little bit with, with you know, the Jacoby Bryant's of the world and some of these younger kids is some of those just quick perimeter throws. A lot of college football, and one of the things I'm, you know, it, it's different navigating college football versus, you know, the NFL, which is what I primarily covered is, so the 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 joes you know the the, the mm-hmm. jimmies and joes matter so much in this game and yeah. sometimes it's a matter of you know you can exploit some jimmies and joes at times too that's one place in one area i could see teams really trying to exploit is perimeter quick throws with blocking out in front i'm a little bit worried about there at the cornerback position i think that's reasonable i think tackling across the board at the ku corner position like i really don't like using the term that like someone is afraid to tackle is the wrong word, but like allergic to tackling is a phrase I've used um, before about some of the guys who have played. And it's not necessary. I think in some cases they're younger, they're slighter, but I think there is a difference between the guys who will at least try to do it and the ones who won't. And I think separately, but somewhat related to this, I think the hope is this year you have more willing 
tacklers, more willing guys who will play up. Even like a guy like Marvin Grant playing safety, like you're kind of bringing in a box safety to play with another sort of box safety with Kenny yeah. Logan. So I, I think they're trying to to maybe figure out ways to piece around that. Maybe they'll move some guys around, but I think, I think that's a very reasonable concern um, on your point on blocking though, on the other side. Yeah. I mean, tight end blocking Mason Fairchild in particular, it seemed like for a very long time, I wasn't sure if he was going to um, how, how I, how I look at blocking I go back and chart. This is not the best way to do it, but it's what I always do. When I rewatch a game, I chart every negative play. I rewind it an extra time and I try to assign blame or percent of blame and, and little points to like who it is. And sometimes it's multiple people. Sometimes I can't tell. And I'm just like, I'm guessing, or I just won't write anything down. But the number of times where it was like he was contributing, not just him by himself, but it was like, you, you got to hit somebody or just get in the way or make a hole or something. Um, and, and it just didn't feel like he was getting to the spots or even when he was that he was winning his blocks. I, I think that got a little bit better at the end of the year. I'm very curious to see the next step because honestly, I kind of thought Jared Casey was better at it. I thought, oh. I, I still think he was the third best at that um, in the tight ends room of the guys last year. So now I'm curious to see where that goes because I think blocking on the boundaries will be huge for the running game too. I think Trevor Cardell, when I saw him try to block, was really it was you know he's he's definitely got some. I mean he's young too. He's got you know he got some. They got time. You know they still got time to develop there. And it got better as the season went on. Yeah, Jared Casey was a pretty solid blocker. Tavita Noah, I think, helps in a lot of that regard. I think that's part of the reason he's here <laughs> is because they want to make sure that they're emphasizing the blocking at the tight end position. But uh, that was the first episode of Booth Review. Mm -hmm. So much fun. Scott Chasen, so excited to be doing this with you, buddy. Uh, really, uh, really glad that we were able to get episode one under our belt here. Yeah, Ken, I'm glad you're in the, you've always been in the KU sphere, but I'm glad you're even more like visible and present and people can see your lovely face talking about Kansas <laughs> because like, I don't think people know, I mean, they're learning, especially if they watch this or if they, they're familiar with anything of, you know, KC Sports Network, but your mind for football is so exciting to me and I'm so excited to dissect like football from your perspective and what you see as we go throughout a season. So I am most excited about that. You joke about being a Scott Chasen fan. I am a Ken Swanson fan. And by the way, I'll tell you when I told my dad, I was doing this, he got really, really excited, but that's because he thought you were Mike Swanson and not Ken Swanson. So I <laughs> that is a true story, by the way. <laughs> I yeah, I could never be Mike Swanson. That man is a legend. <laughs> I will I will say this though, man, before we get out of here. K covering KU uh is a dream for me. And if 20 years ago I, I would have probably picked covering KU over covering the Chiefs. So this is pretty fun. I'm really excited to be doing it with you. We will be back uh next week i believe and mm -hmm. we will be covering ku football all season cannot wait this is booth review we'll catch you later <laughs>